Welcome back, everybody, for another deep dive. This time, we're tackling something that I'm sure many of you out there uh, can relate to, hyperverbosity. And, and before you think, oh, this is just about talking too much, let me right. clarify, it's a lot more than that, yeah. um, especially when we're looking at it through the lens of autism. We're going to be diving into some excerpts from Cheap ABA and an article called Adult Autism and Hyperverbosity, Strategies for Managing the Verbal Overflow. We're really going to try to understand this phenomenon. Yeah, we're going beyond just the surface level. Yeah, you right. know, think of hyperverbosity as, as that feeling of words that are constantly pushing to get out, um, mm -hmm. often at a rapid fire pace. And usually with pretty complex language, it's not simply a matter of being chatty. Right. You know, it's often a response to to deeper needs and experiences. That makes a lot of sense. So it's not just the volume of words, it's also the way they come out. Exactly. Oh. For many autistic individuals, hyperverbosity is a coping mechanism. Just like some people might bite their nails when they're stressed, others might use words to manage anxieties or maybe sensory overload or even, you know, challenges in expressing themselves clearly. Okay, that coping mechanism piece is really clicking for me now. But the article also mentions how isolating hyperverbosity can be. Can you can you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? Absolutely. Imagine constantly feeling like you're overwhelming the people around you with your words. Right. It can lead to social anxiety, you know, feeling misunderstood and sometimes even withdrawing from interactions completely. And that's why understanding those root causes and having strategies for managing those situations is so important. Which is where the strategies from Cheap ABA in the article come in. So let's jump into that first one. Pause and breathe. Seems pretty straightforward, but I'm guessing there's more to it than just, you know, taking a deep breath. You are absolutely right. While it sounds simple, the power of a well-placed pause is actually backed by neuroscience. Wow. When you take that deep breath, you're not just, you know, calming yourself down emotionally. Right. You're actually impacting your physiological state. Interesting. It gives your nervous system a moment to kind of reset. Okay. Which can then help to regulate those rapid-fire thoughts and impulses. Wow. Never thought about it like that. So it's almost like hitting a reset button in your brain. I can see how that could be helpful in those moments when you just feel like you're going to let all these words spill out. Exactly. And building on that, the next strategy focuses on channeling that energy in a different way through mm. visual aids and notes. Okay. The article mentions things like, you know, using diagrams, mind maps, even just jotting down key points. Have you ever have you ever tried anything like that? You know what? I actually have. I'm a very visual learner myself. Yeah. So when I have a lot of thoughts swirling around, sometimes if I just sketch them out or make a quick list, it helps me to organize them. It's almost like I'm taking these these abstract thoughts and I'm giving them a concrete form. That's a fantastic way to put it. Thanks. And think about how valuable that could be. Right. You know, maybe in a work meeting. Instead of feeling that pressure to you know, articulate everything perfectly on the spot, you could use a whiteboard to visually explain your ideas. Yeah. It can really be a game changer for clear communication. It's almost like giving yourself permission to express yourself in a way that feels more natural. Exactly. Okay, so we've got that pause and breathe for regulating the impulses and then visual aids and notes for channeling that energy outward. What's next on the list? Well, this next one shifts the focus outward. It encourages you to practice active listening. Okay. And this is where you're really tuning into what the other person is saying. Not just their words, but their tone of voice, their body language, their overall message. I, I like this one, and it resonates with me a lot. <laughs> but, but I have to admit, sometimes I struggle with this. Like, I know I should be paying attention to those subtle cues, but in the moment, I, I just get so caught up in my own thoughts. Do you have any tips for, you know, for someone like me who wants to be a better listener but finds it challenging? Oh, that's such a common experience. And there are definitely ways to strengthen those, what we call active listening muscles. Okay. One thing that can help is to intentionally focus on one aspect at a time. Okay. So instead of trying to process, you know, everything at once, you could start with just the words. Then on the next interaction, pay attention to their tone of voice. And gradually you'll start picking up on those subtle cues without feeling overwhelmed. So it's about breaking it down into smaller steps, more manageable steps. Exactly. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I'm curious, how does how does active listening help with managing the hyperverbosity? Is it is it just about being more polite and letting other people speak? Or is there more to it than that? 
It really does go deeper than that. Okay. When you're actively listening, you're actually gaining a better understanding of the social context, okay. which can actually help to reduce that urge to over explain or dominate the conversation. Okay. You're more in tune with, you know, what information has already been shared and what the other person is truly looking for. So it's not just about being quiet. It's about actually processing the information and responding in a way that's that's relevant and, and respectful. Exactly. It's about finding that sweet spot between, you know, expressing yourself authentically, but also being mindful of the social dynamics. Okay. We've covered some really solid strategies so far. Pause and breathe, visual aids and notes, and active listening. What other tools are in our toolkit for managing hyperverbosity? This next strategy is one I find uh, particularly intriguing. Use a filter. The article uses this metaphor, uh, imagining a filter between your brain and your mouth. Mm -hmm. And I instantly pictured like this little judge in my head, right. just deciding what gets to come out and what has to stay put. That's a great way to visualize it. Yeah. And, and while a tiny judge might be a bit extreme, the core concept is really powerful. It's about developing that internal checkpoint, you know, where you can pause for a second and just ask yourself, does this need to be said right now? Is it relevant to what we're talking about? Will it contribute positively to the interaction? It's almost like having an inner editor, but for your spoken words. Exactly. And I guess the more you practice using that filter, the more intuitive it becomes. Precisely. It's not about suppressing your thoughts or censoring yourself entirely. It's about learning to navigate those social nuances and choosing when and how to express yourself most effectively. This reminds me of something I've noticed in my own, you know, interactions with people. Sometimes when I'm really excited about a topic, I tend to jump in with all these ideas and tangents before the other person has even finished speaking. And I know it can be overwhelming for them. But in the moment, it feels like I'm, I'm going to burst if I don't get those words out. Oh, that's such a relatable experience. And it highlights a key aspect of hyperverbosity, yeah. the intensity of those internal thoughts and the feeling of urgency to express them. It's not just about wanting to talk. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about that internal pressure that builds up. And I guess that's where this next strategy comes in. Find a verbal release valve. The article talks about having a trusted person could be a friend, a family member, a therapist, or even a support group where you can just let those words flow freely without judgment. That's right. Having that safe and supportive outlet is so crucial. You know, it's like having a pressure valve for those intense thoughts and feelings. By expressing yourself openly and without that fear of overwhelming someone, you can prevent that buildup from spilling over into other situations. So it's about having that designated space where you can just be your full, unfiltered self. Yeah. Which then allows you to be more mindful and intentional in other social contexts. That makes a lot of sense. And it brings us to another proactive strategy for those situations that tend to trigger hyperverbosity. Scripting and planning. The article suggests preparing scripts or outlines in advance, particularly for situations where you anticipate feeling anxious or overwhelmed. Okay, I'm intrigued. But I'm also wondering... Wouldn't that make the interaction feel less authentic, like you're, you know, reading from a script instead of having a genuine conversation? That's a valid concern. And it's not about, you know, memorizing lines or delivering a robotic performance. It's about having those key points or phrases ready so that if you do feel that anxiety creeping in, you have a foundation to fall back on. So it's almost like having training wheels. Exactly. You can rely on them for support mm -hmm. until you feel more comfortable navigating those situations on your own. I yeah. like that analogy. Exactly. And if you look at this from, you know, a psychological perspective, there's there's a lot of research showing that preparation can significantly reduce anxiety. Right. You know, when we feel prepared, we feel more in control, and that can make a world of difference in how we manage those intense emotions. So it's not just about managing the words themselves. It's about managing the underlying anxiety that often fuels those verbal impulses. Which, which brings us to another strategy that emphasizes self-care and emotional well-being, mindfulness and self-compassion. Mm -hmm. This strategy encourages us to cultivate self-awareness, you know, through practices like meditation or deep breathing. Right. It's about becoming more attuned to your internal state, noticing those triggers that might lead to hyperverbosity and learning to respond with kindness and understanding rather than, you know, self-criticism. I've been experimenting with mindfulness myself lately. Yeah. And I have noticed that it does help me to just kind of slow down and, and become more aware of those automatic reactions that I used <laughs> to have. It's like instead of just reacting impulsively, I, I have a moment to choose how I want to respond. 
That's fantastic. And that's exactly the kind of shift that mindfulness can facilitate. It's about creating that space between the stimulus and the response, right. which allows for more conscious and intentional communication. Okay, so we've got a whole toolbox of strategies here, yeah. from regulating those initial impulses to mm -hmm. channeling that verbal energy to practicing active listening and self-care. What's the final piece of the puzzle? Mm -hmm. The final strategy is all about connecting with others who get it. Seek support. The article encourages us to to reach out to um, autistic-led organizations yeah. or support groups. That's right. It's about finding that sense of community and shared experience that can be so empowering. When you connect with people who get it, right. it can really validate your experiences and remind you that you're not alone in this journey. And I imagine those spaces can also be a source of, you know, practical advice. Oh, absolutely. And support, like uh -huh. people sharing tips and strategies that have worked for them. Or even just offering a listening ear when you need to vent. Absolutely. There's a wealth of knowledge and lived experience within those communities. Yeah. And it's such a valuable resource for anyone navigating the the complexities of hyperverbosity. You know, as we've been talking about these strategies, I keep coming back to this idea that it's not just about managing hyperverbosity. It's about embracing neurodiversity yeah. as a whole. And it's not just about tolerance. It's about celebrating those differences mm. and recognizing the unique strengths that, that they bring. That's such an important point. You know, we often frame hyperverbosity as a problem to be fixed. Right. But what if we shift that perspective? What if we started viewing it as a different communication style, yeah. one that has its own value and deserves to be respected? I love that. Instead of trying to fit into a narrow definition of normal, we can start expanding our understanding of what effective communication can look like. Exactly. And that brings us back to that thought-provoking question you raised earlier. Mm -hmm. What about exploring personal communication styles and preferences? Yeah. It's not just about, you know, managing challenges. It's about discovering and honoring those unique ways we connect with the world. So instead of just focusing on what we need to fix or manage, mm -hmm. we can start asking ourselves, what are my strengths? What are my preferences? How can I communicate in a way that feels authentic to me? And how can we create environments that are truly inclusive and supportive of those diverse communication styles? Right. How can we foster understanding and appreciation for the richness that neurodiversity brings to our interactions? Those are powerful questions. Yeah. And I think they challenge us to move beyond those kind of surface level solutions and really dig into the heart of what it means to communicate authentically and respectfully yes. for ourselves and for others. And remember, this exploration is a journey. It's not a destination. There's no one right way to communicate. What works for one person might not work for another. The key is to be open, curious, and compassionate, both with yourself and with others. I love that. Be open, curious, and compassionate. Those are words to live by. So as we wrap up this deep dive, what are some key takeaways you'd like our listeners to ponder? Firstly, remember that hyperverbosity is often a response to deeper needs and experiences. It's not simply about talking too much. It's about understanding those underlying anxieties, sensory sensitivities, and communication styles that might be at play. And secondly, there's a whole toolbox of strategies available to help manage those challenges. Yes. From regulating those initial impulses to channeling that verbal energy in a more productive way. But most importantly, remember that you are not alone. Seek support. Connect with others who understand and embrace those unique strengths and perspectives that neurodiversity brings to our world. This has been such an insightful deep dive, and I hope it's given you some practical tools and a fresh perspective on hyperverbosity. Remember, communication is a beautiful and complex thing, and there's no one right way to do it. Embrace your unique style, honor your needs, and keep exploring what works best for you. And as you continue on that journey, remember to be kind to yourself and to celebrate the diversity of communication styles that make our world so vibrant and fascinating. Until next time, happy communicating.